Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world that you are tuning in from. My name is Rob, and I founded Chocolatey Software a few years ago. So before we get too far down the path, uh, if you'd like to follow along with a worksheet, uh, please download it by going to this URL, bit.ly, so bit.ly, slash the power of simple worksheet. Uh, you can also uh, use your phone uh, with your QR scanner and just point it right up here at the screen uh, to grab that worksheet. And so I'll give you a chance to type in that link or grab that worksheet. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and why I might have some qualifications in talking about simpler experiences. And so as you know, uh, I'm Rob. I've spent my entire professional career making things simpler for folks. I've created tool after tool that takes some concepts that have multiple steps, finding patterns, and removing the complexity down to make it simpler and more approachable for folks. Let me get that link back up there. Uh, and I'm going to move that uh, QR code up to the top corner for the next couple of slides. Uh, and so uh, a lot of what I've done is uh, looking at uh, you know, really complex areas and trying to find all those patterns in there. And, uh, and then trying to make it a lot easier for an end user uh, to do those things. And so automating uh, some of those uh, areas where, where things are a little more complex. So as we give you a little bit more time, let's try to understand what we mean by simple. Given that the word simple has a lot of different contexts and that we all be coming in here with different ideas, Let's try to put a definition around what we mean by that. So let's look at how the word is defined. So Merriam-Webster uh, defines simple as free from guile, innocent, free from vanity, modest, of humble origin or modest position. I'm not really liking these so far. Um, lacking in knowledge or expertise, yeah, definitely not what we're trying to get to when we're talking about simple. So let's see here. Free from elaboration, not limited or restricted. Oh, here we go. Readily understood or performed. So we had to get all the way down to the last definition uh, to get something more in line with what we're looking for. So I'm not really a fan of the definitions we got here. So let's look at another dictionary site. All right, dictionary.com defines simple as easy to understand, deal with, use, etc. I like that definition, right? Uh, not elaborate or artificial, plain, not ornate or luxurious, unaffecting, unassuming modest. Uh, definitely the first definition here uh, is more in line with what we're talking about when we talk about the power of simple. And so let's bring that back. So when we're talking about the power of simple, what, what do we mean by that? Um, and so one of the things is uh, sometimes you hear the term plain and simple, right? Plain is not the same thing as simple. So although they are sometimes used together, plain is not something we mean when we're talking about the power of simple. Plain sometimes has a negative connotation associated with it. Uh, it tends to mean not elegant. And when we want you to think, and we're thinking about the power of simple, it's something that is elegant. All right, so it should be easy to understand. So Picking up uh, that definition that we just saw from dictionary.com, something that is easy to pick up. It should be intuitive to use. Now, intuitive, uh, what does that mean? It sounds so nebulous, intuitive. Uh, breaking it down, it means that we are instinctively, instinctively using something the right way without any consciousness or training. So when something is intuitive, uh, it just makes sense as a feel, right? It, it just feels like the right thing and we're doing things the right way. And we haven't had anybody actually tell us that that's the right thing. Uh, we just kind of saw it and we, we intuitively uh, or uh, unconsciously just understood how to use it, right? Now, uh, this last one is, is kind of interesting. Uh, it should refine and or remove complexities where possible. Now, Sometimes uh, this is removed at a surface level, so and hidden below, and sometimes, uh, and so in that way, we're, we're abstracting out uh, some of the, the complexities, making decisions maybe on behalf of the user, 
and we're giving them a very simple and uh, you know front user interface. Uh, and sometimes, actually, uh, this actually means exploring the requirements and the processes or whatever that, that is gone uh, that is behind those systems, and looking at ways that we can refine that to simplify processes. As an example, uh, when I started out running a business, working on business processes, we actually had a lot of things that we did by hand. And in some cases, uh, we started to put systems in place to reduce that manual work. And in other cases, we actually went back and rethought what we were doing to refine the process uh, to make that process simpler. And both of these things have really allowed us to grow. And so as we give you a little bit more time uh, to get that worksheet, we're going to play a little game. And again, that QR code has just moved up. And so we're going to look at a few images, and we're going to decide if we are looking at a simple design uh, or a uh, not so simple design. So uh, first thing uh, is this. So when you look at this, do you see a simple design here? Uh, I believe that we do, uh, because there is, a, of course, a place that you would place a bottle uh, or a glass and under, and it would sense that, and it would automatically start filling up that uh, water. All right, so what about this? And, uh, I apologize for anybody that this causes anxiety for. Uh, it was found from the dailywtf.com. I remember this image from a very long time ago uh, when I was a daily describer <laughs> way, way, way back. Uh, and so I would ask, do you see a simple design here? Uh, and for anybody that wants to go find this later and read all the fun comments, uh, it is the hotel reservation system from Hell is what I think it's called. Uh, and uh, I would argue here that we do not have a simple design. We have something that probably overwhelms an end user uh, when they are looking at it. Uh, it certainly overwhelms me uh, just staring at it. I'm sure that it overwhelms you uh, in seeing it as well. And so we're just going to move right on past uh, and say that's probably not a simple design. So the last one, what do you think? Simple? And I would say, yeah, absolutely. As we look at this, uh, we have a soap dispenser, it's automatic. And so if we can think about the original design of uh, going up and washing our hands, uh, we would uh, get a bar of soap and uh, we'd lather that up with some water and uh, we would use that process uh, to really wash our hands. And that's really the, the technology that are making that simpler. Now we have something we can simply walk up and put our hand under and then there's that soap that just comes right out. And so that, that makes that process quite a bit simpler. All right, so hopefully by now you've got the worksheet, you got it ready. Uh, or at least have it somewhere where you can reference it. And so to kick things off, uh, it is possible to create a solution to a problem, sometimes even easy. The real work is in simplifying that down. So let's start uh, by thinking about a problem. And then we're going to think about some solutions to that problem, so some options. So say I have a dog. And uh, when that dog gets outside, they run away. right? The, so the problem is, that I do want to let the dog go outside to run around, but I don't want the dog to run away. So what are my options? I can uh, do the do nothing approach, which is to keep the dog inside. Uh, we all know that probably wouldn't work well long term. Um, I could keep the dog on a leash when the dog goes outside. And this seems like a pretty simple solution. Uh, however, it does mean that I always need to go with the dog when we go outside. Now, uh, that could be what I end up with uh, when I look at my other options. So let's explore some of the other options. So I could train the dog uh, to, to stay within a certain area and not run away. Uh, that will take a significant effort, uh, might take a little money, uh, and it's going to take a lot of time. Now, I could also uh, say I don't have a fence. I could build a fence. Uh, and that itself is probably a really good option. However, it does take a lot of time. Uh, it takes some time. It probably takes a lot of money. Uh, and, you know, it may not be allowed where I live. Uh, and so am I missing something simpler? Uh, oh, I could put in an invisible fence. That is simpler. It is probably a lot less money, definitely a lot less money than building a fence and probably less effort there as well. It's probably even less effort than training the dog, right? Uh, but actually, it would also solve the problem of training, right? Depending on the dog, uh, they would actually be trained by this invisible fence. And then I ask the question, well, am I missing some other simple options here? 
And see, that is uh, the essence of simple and refining, right? Uh, as we look at that, simple ain't easy, right? So this is actually one of my favorite quotes. Uh, it captures that essence of achieving simple, right? And it really forms the basis for what we're going to go through here today. Have you ever looked at a problem and found a solution that worked, but felt like it was too much? Maybe it was fragile uh, or easily broken. And maybe, you know, uh, you got away from it for a minute and you were able to come back to it later and find a much simpler way to do the same thing. If you haven't done that, that's okay. That work of reworking a solution until you found uh, or find the simplest way is really capturing the essence of what we do at Chocolatey Software, right? Uh, so one of our core values is strive for simple. We strive for simplicity and common sense in a world where complexity is the norm. A world where common sense is not common practice. And for clarity, I am talking about Windows, right? We achieve simplicity, common sense, and patterns, right? And we're taking these elements and, and we're bringing them back with the, the chocolatey way. To achieve simplicity, you need to get above it all and be able to see the pictures and the patterns of what it is there, right? And only then can you start to categorize and make sense of that chaos and find order in that chaos. So we found order in the chaos of Windows. No, it's true. Stay with me for a moment. I know what you're thinking, right? Software, software management, oh, for in Windows especially, that's like the Wild West. And it, it can be, right? But what I'm telling you is you can achieve simple in the face of what looks to be complex. It's entirely possible. You know, it may take some work. It'll take actually a lot of work, significant effort, but it is possible. I know it is. Uh, I've spent my entire career doing exactly these things, right? You see, simple brings consistency. Simple allows focus. Simple is powerful. What we want to explore uh, is how you can create simple for others. And before we go into that, let's talk more about why simple and why it's important. So, does anyone recognize this? That's right, it's an iPhone. It's a first generation iPhone, right? It's said that, that Apple revolution, uh, sorry, revolutionized the way that we use our phones and has revolutionized that quite a bit. Now, when Apple introduced the iPhone in 2007, was it a new concept, this concept of smartphones? Uh, was Apple the first company to market with a smartphone? No, Palm. Blackberry, Microsoft, they already had smartphones on the market. Uh, so what was different? Well, before we step into that, does anybody recognize this? All right, this is a trio, right? And so uh, if I could take you back to a time, if any of you can recall, uh, before the iPhone, uh, uh, there was these trios and, and other things. And this was, uh, the Palm Trio was like the big thing to have. It was the best thing on the market for a smart type of phone. And uh, back in 2005, 2006, everyone was talking about the trio killer, right? Uh, every time a device would come out. So Windows, uh, Microsoft Windows uh, it had a, a, a mobile version uh, that went on uh, your, your phone, uh, phones at the time there. <laughs> and uh, when one of those come out, they'd say, is, is this going to be the trio killer, right? Uh, and you would see it with other areas as well. And so... When the iPhone came out, right, in 2007, it completely changed the way folks use their phones. Now, we're talking about a phone that most people use as a computer, a computer in your, your pocket, right? So where a laptop is a producer, creator type device, an iPhone has led to more consumption generation, uh, consuming information, and, and applications, right? And so speaking of Apple, you probably recognize this. It's not a Newton. Uh, if you are old enough to remember Newton's, uh, I was in high school uh, when those first personal digital assistants came out, or PDAs. Uh, I myself did not have one. Uh, one of my teachers did, right? The Newton is the category where most of these devices started, right? And again, Apple came out with a product uh, long after other companies did. Uh, Microsoft introduced the tablet PC around 2003, right? Apple came out with the iPad in 2010. Uh, what was different, right? 
Some might say that Apple has a much better marketing strategy, and while I agree that that was uh, likely true, and it is likely true, I think there is something deeper at play, right? Apple is tremendously good, uh, great in fact, at user experience. So whether you like them or not, they do very well on making a product that is easy to use. Uh, I've, they've spent considerable time, right, on making uh, this particular product, the, the, the iPad, uh, easy to learn and use. Uh, they made products so simple and usable that, that very, very young kids, sometimes as young as two year old, two years old, can intuitively pick up and learn to use an iPad, right? It's one button. So you got the one button there, right? It's a touch screen that's very intuitive. These uh, uh, intuitive designs become uh, very simple, right? And so if we were to contrast that, you know, going back to look at this trio, it's like, how do I learn to use this? There's so many buttons and so many things that I can do there uh, that I have to spend time learning actually how to use this device where I could pick this up, uh, this iPad, and I could be very uh, productive with it very quickly. Right? And the new ones, uh, the new ones that are coming out, these new iPads, they don't even have buttons. It's just screen. Right? So they went back and they've continued to re refine their design. And to achieve that simplicity, it takes a lot of work. While it's elegant, and it's simple to use, uh, you know, it appears effortless. But don't be deceived, right? The effort of making something simple is quite a bit of work, right? It requires creating something and then refining it again and again, then asking yourself if it is simple enough yet, and then refining it again. Putting that into people's hands, letting them use it, and then refining it even more, right? So as Steve Jobs marveled in his biography about the de designs of these devices, you know, the iPads and the iPhones, he said, so simple, a child could use it. Uh, and what's really interesting here is I never read Steve Jobs' biography, and I never really researched his work until I started getting into this uh, talk on uh, power of simple. Uh, but I think I realized that we both have similar thoughts on simplicity and have come to the same con conclusions about it, right? And so... Let's take a look at his uh, quote on simple. He says that simple can be harder than complex. So he's saying that it's, it's more work, right? You have to work hard to get your thinking clean, uh, but it's worth it in the end. And, and I, I like that, right? Um, and so that covers uh, product design, right? And user experience and, and the, you know, doing simple with, with those things. Uh, where we see simple is it's not only important, uh, it's actually an essential requirement for the longer term. These products that have great simple designs, they stand the test of time. Right? Can simple work in other areas? What, what about the world of business? Surely we don't need simplicity there, or do we? Now, how many of you have read Jim Collins' book, Good to Great? Uh, I have. It's fantastic, right? It is a bit of a slow start, but it picks up quite quickly. Now, uh, in the book, uh, he talks about a lot of things in here, and uh, one of those things is the hedgehog concept. Are you familiar with the hedgehog concept? So basically, Jim says there's, there's two lines of thinking. So there's the fox, and there's the hedgehog. Uh, foxes craft all kinds of cunning ways to try to catch the hedgehog, trying a new plan every day, uh, sometimes even multiple times a day. Uh, you could also think of this as, uh, if you remember the example of Wile E. Coyote and the Road Runner. Uh, so the fox uh, and the hedgehog, very similar. So each time uh, the fox's plans are foiled, right? As the hedgehog, seeing the fox coming, is, oh, says, here we go again, uh, curls up into a simple ball with pointy spikes. The hedgehog does one thing really well, right? So when I think of a fox, <laughs> I think of this. It's a Rube Goldberg machine. It's typically a very complex contraption that has a lot of moving parts that perform a simple task. So here we see a punching bag hitting a bowling ball, going through all of these you know, weird things and dominoes. And at the end of this, we're turning on a light, right? So a very simple task. So you look at that. It looks absurd. And of course it is. It's a Rube Goldberg machine, right? Foxes love complexity. They love complexity. They love making complex things, sometimes more complex than others can even understand. 
And some of you are, are probably thinking right now, I, I know some coworkers that, that like complexity. I wonder if they're foxes or I know some foxes, right? It might even be you. And that's okay. You know, the world does need foxes. Hedgehogs, in contrast, they're the simplifiers. Foxes are the complicators. Hedgehogs are the simplifiers. Hedgehogs, in contrast, they look at complexities, look at all of the complexities in the world, and they start to work to simplify it. So they have, uh, they, they typically look at one big idea and focus on that, simplifying it down to a fundamental thing, right? A fundamental, simple idea. So Jim goes on to state in the Good to Great book, uh, in the world of leadership and business, hedgehogs win. In fact, it's required for a business to be considered one of the good to great businesses that his research team looked at over the years of his studies, right? Those that simplify are the ones that survive, right? They do the best. They survive long term. So the power of simple comes out in business as well as it does in product design. So what about money? I want to be a millionaire. Don't you? Surely, that needs to have a complex strategy. And in effect, it really, it doesn't, right? And so uh, there was a study uh, of over 10,000 real-life millionaires. So went out, uh, this uh, uh, Chris Hogan went out in the world. They found 10,000 real-life millionaires, and they talked to them, right? Oh, this, is, this is Chris Hogan, by the way. Uh, we did get to meet Mr. Hogan at a conference uh, last year. He's a super nice and very inspiring individual. And so in his book, Everyday Millionaires, uh, over 75% of these 10,000 millionaires that they interviewed, they became millionaires simply by consistently investing in a company-offered retirement plan such as a 401k over a few decades, right? So uh, they did something simple. They did something consistent over a long period of time. And so they did a couple of other things but what built them that wealth was simply being consistent, right? And most folks who are, are smart with their money, uh, they don't invest in things they don't understand. So if you're familiar with Dave Ramsey, uh, he likes to say uh, that if you invest in stuff you don't understand, that's a really good way to lose your shirt, right? The 401k is a very simple vehicle to get you there. Uh, and so now that may not apply in, you know, of course, every situation. And I am sure there are other methods to making money. So please uh, don't sacrifice me uh, in the comments and in the notes. But what I'm presenting is that simple and consistent behaviors have made the bulk of folks like you and me into millionaires over their career. I'm just giving you a simple strategy. Doesn't mean it's easy, just that it works. So spend less than you make. Save 15% of your income for retirement. It works every time. So the power of simple works in product design, simple works in business, and simple works in money. But what about food? Oh no. Oh, we're bringing it close to home now. Food. What about food? Is there power in simple with food? Well, like it or not, what we choose to put in our mouths have consequences, right? Uh, a lot of us just shove food in as fuel without always considering the ramifications uh, of the food that we're, we're eating, right? And our food choices actually do have some power over us. Uh, for instance, have you ever ate a donut uh, or something with maybe high sugar and starches and then uh, you were lethargic when the sugar rush wore off or you, you ate a big lunch, right? Uh, went to the buffet and, uh, you know, had to get your money's worth and so you ate everything, right? Uh, you ate a big lunch, probably more than you should have, and then you're ready to take a nap around two o'clock, right? When all of that kind of set in. And we've all been there, uh, but maybe not all of us were tie, able to tie those two events together. And so if you break that cycle uh, by making different choices, then you don't actually have those periods of low productivity. Now, some of you out there may have a good body type where you could just put a about anything in your body without care uh, and without any weight gain. And some of you uh, may know somebody who falls into this category. I certainly know some folks that fall in this category. Hint, it's not me. 
Uh, so for many of us, when we prefer the simpler and a natural, uh, more natural ingredients, it, it does have a much better effect on us. So uh, let's say for illustration on simple versus complex is that complex foods are like the food up in the top left, right? Where uh, you know we have a lot of ingredients and they're processed, uh, uh, or those, those kinds of things. And in contrast. Our simple is things that are natural, like uh, our, our green beans and our chicken breast. And so when you choose simple over processed foods, the effect can be that you don't crash and burn, and you're able to stay productive all day. Uh, your mood uh, could actually be better as well. Uh, so what about exercise? <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't touch that, right? But move more, eat less, something like that, right? Uh, so you may be asking yourself at this point, we've talked about product design, we've talked about leadership and business, money and food, all of this in the name of simple, but what does that have to do with PowerShell and DevOps? Uh, I was simply trying to illustrate how simple is in many areas of our lives. So what does simple have to do with PowerShell? Uh, when we think about PowerShell and DevOps, uh, simple comes into what we produce as solutions, so more in the design, so that product design. So when you're designing a module, you're designing functions, uh, it becomes everything that you ask for, uh, the names, the descriptions of your parameters, and, and how you communicate with your end user, right, on either logging what's going on, or your error messages, or other things. And so much goes into the UX or user experience and design of these things, but some of us, some of us who create these things are, are accidentally creating designs and not always thinking about consistency and simplicity, right? So what you end up with is something that's maybe haphazard uh, and maybe not consistent. But if instead uh, we were intentional in that design, it does have the potential to become simpler and it has the uh, potential to become a more straightforward experience for our users, right? And so what you might say, hey, Rob, I'm not a designer. I might be a developer, but I write modules. I write scripts. I write functions. I write PowerShell. Uh, and of course, there has been a lot of talk in the past on whether that makes you a developer, whether uh, writing PowerShell makes you a developer. I'm on Team Developer, by the way. Um, but I think that we could put a much stronger argument uh, that folks that create solutions not just PowerShell, but really any solutions, they're either following or they're creating a design. So the design's already been prepared for them and they're just following that, or they are creating a design as they create it, right? And that means when we are writing PowerShell modules and scripts that will be used by others, we are either accidental or intentional designers. And if we think about that for a moment, we would much rather want to be uh, intentional and consistent about our designs, right? Uh, and so I want you to think about this for a moment. Hicks Law. It's actually Hicks slash Hyman's Law. Um, and what this says is the more choices a person is presented with, the longer it will take them to make a decision. Uh, and this is typically used in other areas of design where they are looking at you know, how to present a user with the right number of choices uh, and reduce the complexity uh, of an existing system or make sure that uh, there's not too many decisions to be made. So let's put that another way uh, and let's say that more choice does not equate to better, right? More choice does not equate to better. Uh, it's actually the opposite. So when you start introducing more choices, you slow down a user or you can cause decision fatigue. So why, uh, when we enjoy using technology, uh, we actually don't notice that it has made a lot of the, the choices for us because uh, without being presented with those, we just don't think about them. So in striving for a simpler experience when we are making something, we should be refining and removing out the extraneous decisions that users have to make. So if we were to take Hicks' law a step further, we could always go down the recommended path by default. In fact, we have a name for sensible defaults in software, convention over configuration. If you think about the best, most sensible, or most likely default choice, 
then that is typically what should be the default path through. In convention over configuration, you assign the default path, but then you also allow someone to change that behavior with parameters. So what does this look like? Uh, so in a PowerShell function, it could manifest as setting parameters with the sensible defaults that are most likely to be used. Um, it could manifest in other ways as well. But it's really important for us to understand the user's intent. Right? If you have a script that is meant to update an application configuration, the end intention is that the application configuration should be there and updated. But what if the application configuration didn't exist in the first place? Do you error? Or do you try to think about what the user's end intent is, uh, which in this case is to have an application configuration on a particular version, and then go ahead and add it all first, and then make sure that it's on that version. You see, those are possibly two very different code paths, uh, but one of them is likely to frustrate folks a lot less. Uh, I tell you, if a system, I uh, cast it to upgrade something and that thing wasn't there, uh, my intent was to have it there and upgraded to that version, I would be frustrated if it didn't do that. Um, and so I would want to, to do that so that I would be uh, less uh, frustrated. So, uh, so when you pick a default, in this case, if you pick the wrong default, uh, and it's not what we would consider that most sensible default, it could cause frustration for your users. So it's really important uh, that you pick those good defaults and you understand your user intent, uh, which will help guide you down the path of picking the good defaults. So, picking on myself for a moment, I can do that, right? Okay, so let's look at the following and make a decision about what represents a better design. Now, please uh, don't attack the PowerShell code here or say it's missing some things. Of course, it's missing some things. That was done on purpose uh, to really uh, reduce the amount that we had to look at here so we could be able to easily illustrate some concepts. And so what we're looking at is a couple of functions here. Uh, both of them do basically the same thing. Uh, one is named install uh, dash chocolatey path, and the other is add dash directory to path environment variable. Now I can tell you which one of those two makes more sense uh, in the design telling me exactly what it's doing. Uh, I can get that without having to go to the documentation. The other, I might have to read some of the documentation to understand what's going on. Right, so this is me picking on myself. Both of them are looking at, at possibly a sensible default for the path uh, environment variable target um, because we have process, we have user, and we have, uh, I think it's machine. And one could argue that either of those, uh, user or machine, is a sensible default. But what we're seeing here is that we have these two functions, and one of them uh, tends to have a little bit better design. And so as we uh, look at this next one, uh, and this is looking at a sensible default that's actually bad. Um, we see that we're setting process as the default when we're adding a directory to path environment variable. Uh, if we're testing, uh, that might be the right default or the value that we should be passing so that we're not actually making changes to the machine. Uh, but when we hand that to our end user, their intent uh, is uh, that default they are looking for is, is, is the machine or the user. All right, and so as we look at another area where we have gone down the path of a bad intent and not meeting that user intent, uh, we can see here that uh, when we've tried to add a directory and that directory already exists, uh, we decided to throw an error. Uh, with this, when uh, a, a user says, hey, I'd like to have something there, and it's already there, uh, it's actually incorrect for us to throw an error message because the end intent of the user was to have that there and it was there. So what we should have done instead is probably log a message, right? So that looks like this. And so we're letting them know that it's already there. And then we'll typically probably return without following through the rest of the code. So that uh, uh, because we've met the intent of what the user wants to do. And so what what makes for a good error message? And so uh, <laughs> when we think about error messages and communicating back to our users about what's wrong, uh, 
we can go one of two routes. So in this, we have two ways of, of communicating errors. And so we have the null reference exception, something went wrong, null reference exception, which is, is probably my least favorite uh, error message of all time, null reference exception. It's something that we seen, have seen for years on the C Sharp side. It gives us absolutely no information about where it came from or why or what to do about it other than uh, something was null. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I would argue that that's probably one of the uh, a really, really bad uh, method of communicating with your users, right? So not being very simple. Uh, where in the bottom here we have a message that a file already exists and that we failed trying to create it because it's already there and that we are asking it to uh, pass force to delete files or remove or rename the existing file and try again. So we're actually giving somebody uh, some actions that they can do to make that happen. So when you look at this, what, what does this have to do with simple, right? Uh, it could feel uh, that the, the shorter error messages are simpler. Uh, well, they short, certainly are shorter to write, uh, but they don't help the end user. Uh, and so they're out trying to figure out what went wrong and how they can correct it. And so you're actually making your system more complex. Right. When you have your user spending more time to figure out what went wrong, you're adding to the complexities of your system. Right. And this other message is what we call actionable error messages. Right. Uh, so here again, uh, we're telling them very clearly what went wrong, where. Right. So we mentioned the file, so they got a location, and why. Right. And then we're explaining routes to correct the issue so that the user can move forward, right? It's clear, it's concise, and it makes your system simple. Uh, and so coming back to simple, simple doesn't mean less work. Uh, in fact, here, no, it means uh, making something simple usually means more work and refining things. Uh, we probably started with the message of something went wrong, and hopefully we refine it to have a message that tells us exactly what we need to do uh, as a user to move forward when we do run into these errors. So how do we refine? Uh, that's always a fun process. Um, so let's explore that just for, for a few minutes. Uh, so on the left here you see we have update file and uh, we're taking in a couple of parameters, name and file. Uh, it's not fully clear uh, what uh, file is supposed to be. Uh, name we kind of think is probably file name. And uh, down here we have some code that would update an existing file, right? Uh, as we look to kind of refine that a little bit, uh, we could change the name uh, to update or create file. Uh, and don't, don't sacrifice me if that's not quite right in verbiage. And then get a little more explicit. So that file name, because uh, that's just the name, is that a, re uh, a re relative path or is that a Full, full path. And so how we're saying that needs to be the file absolute path. So that's the full path to that file. And uh, the file contents. And so we could also put in something on the uh, encoding that needs to be there. And so as you see, we've kind of changed the method around a little bit. So if the file doesn't exist, we're actually going to create the file. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and update an existing file. Now, we could actually refine that a little bit more. And so here, uh, on the left again, that was the, the refinement. And then the additional refinement here is uh, we could say, OK, we'll put some validation around this. Uh, we'll put some error handling that has these actual error messages. Oh, and also, what if the directories don't exist? Well, we need to make sure that if I've given an absolute path, uh, I should probably go ahead and handle all the directory creation because that was the end user intent, right? I'm creating a file at this path. If the file path doesn't exist to get to that, go ahead and make it. Uh, don't make it harder for me uh, as a user. Now, uh, another interesting thing here is we're actually simplifying because creating the file and updating the existing file in the previous area were both the same set of code. What we can actually do is we can create an empty file if it doesn't exist. And then instead of branching off and having two separate lines of code where we have more tests, uh, we would actually just update the now existing file if it was just created or the existing file if it was already there. So uh, in this case, we're refining that even more to say, if we had an no file, uh, we'll go ahead and create an empty file, and then we'll run the normal code path, which is to go ahead and update that, that file. So uh, this is refined. We could probably do more with refining it, but uh, this is a good place to, to 
kind of stop on that. Uh, and so while there's a, a lot of areas we could go into, uh, we don't have time. Uh, so let's bring it all together. And so in bringing it all together, I'm going to share a core value that I want you to think about and use. And again, that is our strive for simple. Simple is everywhere. Uh, as we've seen today, uh, product design uh, and leadership in business, money, food, exercise, it's there in nature. Uh, it's everywhere, right? Strive for simple. Simple brings consistency. It's almost always possible to create a solution to a problem, sometimes even easy. The real work is in simplifying that down. Strive for simple. Spend more time thinking about your end user and their intentions. Resist the urge to go with your first solution and spend some more time refining your user experience. Strive for simple. It's powerful and it makes a lasting difference. Thank you.